Hello and welcome to this presentation about the sedimeter for sediment spill monitoring. Back in the 1980s, 30 years ago, I was doing a thesis about sediment transport and I needed a reliable way to detect when sediment transport was taking place. For that purpose I invented the sedimeter which in the sensor has a number of optical backscatter detectors about one centimeter apart and the way they work is as follows in that one there were 16 in the original one so we have 16 detectors here and each one of them measures it sends out light and measures how much light is reflected that's why it's called an optical backscatter detector and let's say the one up here in the water doesn't detect much and then when we get let's say the bottom is somewhere here so when we start getting close to the bottom the values go up and above below the bottom they are basically saturated very high values of course it depends a bit on how it's calibrated and what kind of bottom it is so if we connect these here with the line you see that we can interpolate and find out where the bottom is and that's how the instrument is doing it by measuring the backscatter with a high resolution analog to digital converter and estimating the level of the bottom it's able to determine the level to better than one millimeter even though the detectors are only one centimeter apart and it's repeatable it's highly repeatable so a single grain of sand can be detected if it's added or removed and that's important if you have a sheet transport over the bed so that there are no instead of bed forms moving it's all flat and it's, the sand grains are just moving on the surface in that case you need to be able to detect very very small differences the other thing is that sometimes it's a question of what is actually the bottom and this instrument doesn't just measure the level of the bottom, but it measures a vertical profile. So if you have, for instance, deposition of a layer of mud above a sand bottom, you should see that in the display in the instrument where it plots a vertical turbidity profile. And you can see that there are two different things. Now, that was 30 years ago I invented that. Much later, I came to work in uh, the building of the Öresund Bridge between Sweden and Denmark, a huge project. When building that, for environmental reasons, it was decided that they could not spill more than 5% of the dredged amount, and that they had to measure the sediment spill with 1% precision, that is 1% of the dredged amount, not of the spill. So to be able to measure that, they set up a system where they, first of all, they defined, let's say that we're working here with dredging, they defined a work zone as 200 meters outside, and anything that left the work zone was defined as spill. So there was a boat, actually there were two ships, so that they could work 24-7 all the time. And the boat, I'll draw it up here, so the boat was pulling a cable, actually the, the cable would bend the other way, the boat was pulling a cable with a weight down here and along this cable there were optical backscatter detectors basically the same kind of detectors as in the sedimeter. So this created a vertical profile of sediment concentration. And by going here, back and forth, back and forth, and sometimes going around to check what comes into the area, they created a database with a tremendous amount of data points, about four or five different depth levels depending on the depth and of course it's not the same time all of it but 
It's possible with statistics, which they deployed uh, the best mathematicians they could find to calculate and estimate and prove that they could measure it with 1% resolution. I was the one, I was the expert for the Swedish government in supervising this project. So I was involved in, in analyzing and making sure that their calculations and their measurements and their data and everything was right. That was an extremely expensive undertaking though. Their numbers were secret, they never revealed them, but in, in private they told us, and it was a lot of money. So, after that, I started thinking that there has to be a cheaper way of doing it. And I remembered the instrument, that I, uh, the centimeter. But of course, that centimeter was a bit clumsy, so I designed a new version with a longer sensor. This is centimeter second generation. It has 36 optical backscatter detectors instead of 16, and a much smaller house because it's using more modern electronics, doesn't take so much space. So this one I made and sold and was used for a few years, but it was kind of uh, a little bit sensitive. Too many things here that could, where it could leak water and uh, it had some optional features like a pressure sensor and a light sensor, but you had to open it to get the data out and to put in new batteries. And all of these places was a potential source of leak. So I made a new version in 2013. This is the present version, the third generation. It has no sensor house. It's just the 36 optical backscatter detectors, the electronics that stores the data, battery that's rechargeable, an underwater connector. So you connect it here and you can have it connected by cable and get real-time data and keep it charged. Or it can be connected to this radio modem. It's a little radio sitting in here. It's a plug-in radio, so it can be changed depending on the, what part of the world you are and what radio frequencies are allowed. It connects directly onto the centimeter, but of course you, you would put a cable between normally and put this on a buoy. This has a solar panel built in, so it charges itself and it charges the centimeter. And in fact, you could connect three centimeters maybe to this. It could be a good number because when you do this, let me show you how to set up a measurement system with this principle. We have the same work area and we have the same 200 meter or 150 meters they have here in Florida work zone. So instead of going back and forth and measuring, we would then set up, oh, the other thing is that when you measure in the water with the boat, the turbidity, what you measure is the turbidity in the water, but what actually is of most, uh, most damaging to the fauna in the sea is what falls on the bottom, the sedimentation on the bottom. There are two things that causes damage mostly. It's the accumulation of sediments on the bottom and it's the near bed elevated turbidity. Remember, the centimeter measures the, the turbidity. It measures the turbidity in the water and below the bottom. And then it estimates the level of the bottom. So the centimeter will give you both the near bed turbidity and the level of the bottom. In fact, this third generation has a 37th optical backscatter detector up here. It says turbidity. So it has a turbidity detector a bit higher up, a dedicated one. So that even if it gets a lot buried up very high, you still get turbidity in the water. So, instead of measuring turbidity up in the water where it's not very relevant because fishes, nekton, they can swim away. It's harmful when it gets on the bottom where there, especially coral reefs are the ones 
the, the fauna that is most affected by, most sensitive to sedimentation, but also oyster beds. Uh, if it gets too much, it will affect even seagrass beds when they get buried. But corals can get damage from as little as one millimeter, and therefore it's important that it's able to measure with that accuracy. So, let's say we have a zone here that is sensitive, then the thing to do is will be to put out some instruments here. And since they can be connected with cable or a radio modem or both, you can get data in real time. And if we see that dredging here is causing sediment spill over here, having data in real time, it can send the, the software, it can send an alarm, an email. And uh, one could actually set up permit conditions that requires them to suspend work or find out what's wrong. Maybe something has started leaking so that they can take action immediately before a problem happens. If you are dredging and pumping material into shore, for instance, for beach replenishment, then maybe there can be a leak in the tubing which can cause sedimentation here. With the method that they're using now here in Florida still today, which is go out and check the bottom before, and then do the work, and then go out and check it after and see did we screw it up. But it's kind of late, isn't it? That's why I wanted to advance this method to measure in real time what's happening, so that one can do something about it before it caused damage to the coral reefs. So, now, an another thing is that if you put these out, just a single one, there is always a risk that is not representative. And in coral reefs, like here in Florida, you often have situations where you have a little bit of sand between coral knolls like that. And then you would, well actually they wouldn't be like that, they would be more irregular and flat and so on. Some corals growing up here. So you would maybe want to put one centimeter here in the sand and one centimeter up here. And then you have the risk also that something happens to come here, a piece of plastic or something in garbage in the water, so you get um, spurious data, which is a reason why it's always a good idea to have at least two instruments. And here you have another reason to have two instruments, because there are two different kinds of bottoms. So putting two, three, four, maybe as much as five instruments in a cluster can be a good idea. And they can be connected to a single buoy to send data back. So you don't need to have one of these SETI links for each centimeter. You can have a cluster. This also gives you the advantage if you want to do creaking. The software includes a method to do creaking, which is a method of interpolating between the stations. And by having a cluster of instruments, instead of a single instrument, have several instruments in each spot like this, you get an idea of the local variability, which is called the nugget effect in Krieging. So, for instance, it could be if, if the whole area looks like this, that the difference between here and here is larger than between the different stations. So therefore, putting out the instruments in a smart way, defining the system for creaking, and then do the creaking. The creaking produces two maps. It's pr it produces the average, and it produces a map over uncertainty. So you can see where do I have a lack of data in this area. Now, in the typical dredging situation, you would not need to have them all out in all of this area the whole time, because 
if you have a work area like this, the dredger doesn't work all over the whole area the whole time. It works from one side to the other. So you can put out some instruments over here when you start work here. When you get over here, you move these instruments. And then the whole time maybe you have a reference instrument over here. This is of course assuming the current always is that direction. And then you move that instrument over there. So that way you don't need that many instruments. You don't need to have, even if you have 30 stations, let's say, you don't need to have 30 instruments because you keep moving them. So, well, that ends the presentation. I hope you liked it and look into the website lindron.com for information about the instruments. And we have a blog sedimeter.com with uh, stories about the sedimeter instrument and deployments. Thank you.